Good afternoon, booktubers, and all those visiting, and all you ships at sea. Today, I'm taking advantage of this gorgeous weather to film at the French Broad River again. This is one of the parks I've not been to before. But it is absolutely beautiful. It's got great views of the river. And it's got great places to sit that are just tree dappled. So, anyway, I'm Michael Romeo, and I talk about books. And today, I'm talking about my favorite nonfiction books. And they're coming right up. Hey, booktubers and visitors. Glad you're all here. Today, we're talking about my favorite nonfiction books. Yeah, not in any particular order. Because just like with fiction books, I don't think I could pick just one favorite to have as number one. Um, but these are the 13, Baker's, a Baker's Dozen, 13 nonfiction books that have brought me the most pleasure, that have um, excited me the most, that have just um, really impressed me. So, let's start right in. And the first one is The Accidental Buddhist by Dinty W. Moore. That's right, you heard me right. It was written by Dinty Moore. Um, I don't think it's the same Dinty Moore as the Beast do, but um, that's, that's his name, Dinty W. Moore. Anyway, he's an executive, and he um, was looking for some ways of having peace in his life, and decided to do some spiritual searching, and stumbled onto Buddhism, and uh, it's like Buddhism pulled him in, kicking and screaming all the way. And um, I'm not sure by the end of the book he was convinced that Buddhism was the only way to go, or the right way to go. But um, he definitely was open to it, had some funny encounters along the way. And uh, the book is just, it's a wonderful combination of his humorous and ante anecdotes, there we go, <laughs> humorous anecdotes. And um, and just the spiritual stuff that he read, he discovered and went into, and um, that was the number one on my list. Well, the first one on my list. Second one, classical music for dummies, by David Pogue and Scott Speck. Um, I've loved classical music since I was a kid. Uh, my mother even one time caught me watching an opera on. PBS when I was about, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old, and she looked at me and said, Dude, I, wonder, I wonder if we accidentally brought home the wrong baby from the hospital, because no one else in my family is into classical in any way, shape, or form, um, but I always have been, and I decided when I was an adult, I said, you know, I, I love listening to classical music, I know what I like, but I don't know about classical music, I don't know... Um, the difference between a symphony and a concerto. What, what, why is one a concerto and one a symphony? What makes a sonata a sonata? And um, I got this book, Classical Music for Dummies. And it answered all those questions and some I never even thought to ask. Uh, the writing was at times a little trite. Um, but overall, it was full of great, 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 information, lots of trivia, and it was a lot of fun to read. came with a CD um, that you, you read from the book while listening to the CD and explained at different time markers on your CD what was happening and why they were doing what they were doing. And um, that was really helpful. It helped me to understand um, The Rites of Spring by Stravinsky. I still don't like it but now I understand it. <laughs> um, next, we have How the Irish Saved Civilization by Thomas Cahill. Thomas Cahill is a great historian. He, he is wonderful, and he makes history so accessible. And this was just one of many books that I've liked by him. Uh, it's my favorite of all his books. Uh, How the Irish Saved Civilization centers on the Dark Ages when the monasteries 
were copying books as you know the black plagues happening and all kinds of other horrible things are happening and civilization is basically falling apart and um, they they saved all the information that would have otherwise been destroyed and uh, it was they saved history they saved all kinds of valuable information and uh, they did it all just because they liked copying books and uh, he, he makes a good argument for how the Irish the, especially the um, the monasteries in Ireland how they saved civilization good book uh, follow that with Galileo's daughter by Dava Sobel um, Dava Sobel is a great writer I've enjoyed so many of her books um, Galileo's Daughter is a wonderful book. Uh, Galileo's Daughter uh, was a nun and um, lived in the convent. And the book is based on the correspondence between Galileo and his daughter. And it's especially interesting when Galileo is going through his troubles with the Catholic Church to have a Catholic daughter that he's communicating with and the the story that it tells is pretty riveting and um, Davis Sobel makes it read quite like a novel um, another book by Davis Sobel is Longitude okay now Longitude who would guess that a book on how Longitude was discovered would be interesting well it is it, it is fascinating how you know we had latitude down and um, but to keep ships from getting lost we had to figure out a way to measure longitude and it goes into a whole history of uh, timekeeping clock making and all this other stuff that fed into the discovery on how to track longitude and there's a lot of spy kind of stuff there's a lot of subterfuge and uh, one-upmanship and it too is an exciting reading. Davis Sobel, like with Galileo's daughter, makes it read like a novel and this one is a short one and a lot of people could probably read it in one sitting. I read it in probably about two sittings. Um, next, When in Rome by Robert J. Hutchinson. When in Rome is a delightful book written by a devout Catholic who decided he was going to go live in Rome and just document what life was like in Vatican City and um, he does a good job he learns a lot of stuff about Catholicism that um, was a bit embarrassing it's a bit of mud on the church's face but he takes it with grace and uh, shares it and some of it is just hysterically funny laugh out loud funny and um, it, it's, it's just a delightful bit of journaling. Uh, Under the Tuscan Sun, I've talked about this book before by Francis Mays. Uh, I love Tuscany. I would wish I could go to Tuscany. It is just beautiful, the pictures I've seen of it. And here she is with her partner just buying a farmhouse, a rundown farmhouse, and renovating it in a foreign country where they don't know a lot of the language and uh, learning the culture around them as, as they continue to grow. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful book, beautifully written, written with passion, written with um, humanity. And uh, Under the Tuscan Sun is definitely worth the read. What they did to the movie, what they did to the book in the movie is tragic, I have to say, because the book was so good, and if they had just stuck to the book, it would have been a beautiful movie. But, oh well, they didn't. Opens it up for someone else to do it better. Um, a Year in Provence, Peter Mayle. This is the French version of Under the Tuscan Sun. Peter, Peter Mayle and his wife um, sold their condo in London and moved to Provence, France. It must be nice to have the money to be able to do this kind of stuff, you know, just up sticks and go. Um, I sure don't, <laughs> but uh, 
they, they encountered similar things to Francis Mays in that they had to learn the culture, learn the language. They, uh, they run into some humorous situations and um, Peter Mayle is very good at keeping the humor going. Uh, I, I love it when they get presented with um, a fox and a recipe on how to prepare it. That was that scene is a laugh fest all in itself. And then a brief history of time by Stephen Hawking. Okay, I, I, this is on my favorites, but I have to admit it hurt my brain a little bit. Uh, it was difficult to uh, to read because. He goes into so much detail, and uh, it's about physics. I'm not much of a science-minded person. I'm more history-minded, and um, other kinds of, of factual stuff interest me. But science is not my strong suit. And to have to think like a scientist while reading this book was, um, it, was um, it was an exercise. Um, but I'll tell you what, when I did finally get it, when I got like something to do with quantum physics and it finally clicked in my head and I understood what he, was, what he meant, what a triumphant moment the, those things were. Um, Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson. Folks, this book is worth the read. It is so funny. Bill Bryson and a friend of his, both very out of shape, decide they're going to walk the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. That's a long way. But they set out to do it. And um, it, it's, again, it's a laugh fest. Bill Bryson is is a comic in his own right. And uh, he found all the humor in what was going on. Um, there are a couple of disturbing moments when he, he gets serious and talks about some things that have happened on the Appalachian Trail. But for the most part, it is a uproarist book. Uproarist? Is that a word? Well, if it wasn't, it is now because I just created it. And then next we have John Adams by David McCulloch. John Adams. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning book and um, I really liked it because it got very personal with John Adams. Uh, it took a lot of information from his journals and his letters. Um, gave you some situations that a lot of history books haven't given us like there's one that's just such an intimate moment for him where he um, a Puritan wanders into a Catholic church and witnesses a rosary being prayed um, by the entire congregation and how it hits him um, he was obviously ignorant of what was going on and what the history was behind it because of his reaction, but it was still fascinating to have that reaction. And, um, and, and there were other moments, like his first uh, transatlantic journey to France with his son. Uh, I'd never read about this in any other books about John Adams, and uh, again, it was very personal, very, very intimate in the way it's presented. And it too reads like a novel. Um, David McCullough, just, it captures the life of the man, not just the facts of the man. And um, that's a big difference when doing a history book. Cloister Walk by Kathleen Norris. Beautiful book. This book is about a poet she is a poet, Kathleen Norris, and um, she's a lay minister for, I believe, if I remember correctly, the Methodist Church, and um, somehow got drawn into doing two nine-month stints, called a residency, I guess, in a Benedictine monastery, and it's her journaling. It's her essays that came from it. It's her thoughts that came from this very introspective um, t undertaking that she did. And uh, her writing is just gorgeous. And um, you don't have to be 
uh, a Christian to appreciate it. You don't have to be of any spiritual bent to appreciate it. Just appreciate beautiful writing. And I think you'll find that um, that she, she has a great way of presenting to the reader the inner workings of the spirit and the mind. And then the last book on the list is The Story of English um, by Robert McCrum, Robert McNeil, and William Cran. It's a history of the English language, just like the title implies. And uh, it's a fun book. It talks about how different dialects came about, um, how words came into being to usage, uh, how a lot, a lot of phrases phrases came into usage and then fell out of usage. And uh, if you're into that kind of um, etymology of the English language, which I, I love etymology, and uh, it, it's just a tour de force exploring our own language, stuff that you never knew about um, gets brought up and it's, it's a riveting read. It really is. It's a lot of fun. Very fun read. So that's it. That's my Baker's Dozen of favorite nonfiction books. And um, let me know in the comments. Have you read any of these? Are you interested in any of these? What are your favorite nonfiction books? What should I be reading? What should I be looking for in my next nonfiction reads? Um, as always, love talking with you guys. Love seeing what you have to say in the comments. It makes my day. And um, I hope the weather where you are is as beautiful as it is where I am. It is right now in the low 70s. It is perfect weather. And um, I'm sure you can hear the birds and the chirpers and the churrers and just all around me, just beautiful music. It is the music of nature. Um, so, I'll see you all next time. If you like the video, go ahead and click like. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and click subscribe. It really does help my channel in the whole YouTube scheme of things. Um, and uh, I appreciate you guys being here. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.